Hello, my name is Scott Carey and I'm an editor over at Tech World. I'm joined today by Lillian Lee. Uh, Lillian is an investor at Eight Roads uh, Ventures, but she is also the co-founder of Diversity VC. Uh, thanks for joining me today, Lillian. Thank you, Scott, for having me. Very welcome. So um, I think the best place to start is to get a little bit of an idea of your kind of career in VC uh, or how you ended up in VC. So where, where did that uh, part of your career start? Um, so I think like most VCs, I kind of fell into VC. Everyone says that. Everyone says that. And I feel like if you say you didn't fall into VC, I'm, I always, I'm a bit suspicious. Yeah, I wonder where you came from. Exactly, exactly. So um, I'll sort of jump you into kind of three years into management consulting. At that point, I had done a bunch of private equity cases and was semi-convinced that I actually had no skill set. Um, liked private equity and was like, okay, so this at least I know how to do, so let me go and try to get a job in private equity. Um, and like any any good consultant, I you know tried to get into um, a role repeatedly. Actually, I ended up going for seven or eight different interviews with different uh, PE funds, yeah. uh, and all of them very wisely said no to me. And I think that was actually a great decision on their part. Uh, but back in back at that point, I was like, oh my god, I don't think this is going to work out. Um, but maybe. Before I quit, let's try this one last thing that the headhunter had put me um, up for. And I went in and the experience was completely different to all the other interviews. You know, they just wanted to sort of get to know me, get my thoughts on technology. And then after two weeks, I got an offer. And at that point, I was like, oh, you know, this is great. They had no idea what they got themselves into. And I very happily rocked up on my first day and sat in the management meeting, the Monday morning meeting where you know everyone sits down and sort of discuss what the deals are in progress. Um, and then I heard all these terms like liquidation preferences and cap table. And you know, at that point I was like, okay, so these are terms I've never heard before. I have a sneaking suspicion I'm not actually in private equity. <laughs> and that was the day I discovered that I actually landed in VC instead. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Um, so you landed in VC, I think you went and then did a stint over at Salesforce Ventures. I did, yes. Um, and now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you're at Eight Roads. Mm -hmm. um, so how did uh, you end up at Eight Roads and kind of what is your uh, focus at that fund? Yeah, that's a good question. So. Um, I ended up at Eight Rows, I think, as a part of the evolution of um, having had a really great SaaS enterprise focus when I was at Salesforce doing um, just that across Europe. Um, I wanted potentially to widen my scope of investment expertise a bit more. And after talking to, you know, after being in the industry and talking to a few more VC funds, I felt like there was a really great uh, connection with the Eight Rows team. Um, and I think this is a bit more about kind of the Eight Rows mentality. They're very thoughtful, they're very analytical, um, which sounds a bit different to kind of the general VC type. And I think that's what I kind of very much appreciated about, about the team. They think very deeply and they're very humble. Um, and they would invest at the Series B level, but across every single sector, as long as they think there is you know, defensibility and there is a proven product market fit and also ability to scale from a sales and marketing perspective, um, then we get, we get very excited. So um, I also just very much love the people that, you know, you sort of just sit that and- counts. Exactly, exactly. And then sort of life is, life is short, so spend it with people that you like working with. Um, and after talking with everyone, um, I just felt like it was a place that I could really learn a lot from. And yeah, I've been there ever since. Great, and yeah. then in 2016, you got involved in uh, what is now uh, called Diversity VC. Yeah. Um, can you tell me how you kind of got involved with that project and uh, what work you have done there in the last two years? Right, so this started off quite organically. Um, I don't want to make my life sound haphazard, but again, it was something I fell into. Wow. Um, my approach to life is usually to say yes when, when people come along with, with something interesting. Uh, it started off when I took over organizing these ladies and VCs dinner because the, someone else was like, actually, I need help right. organizing. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll definitely help. And at one of these dinners, I met Czech, who is my co-founder. And Czech loved the dinner, and the dinner format was kind of very, kind of these small 10 to 12 um, women having a very kind of informal chat. You know, we're all VCs, uh, and, but the topic wasn't about deal flow. It was very much just like, let's just connect as people. Yeah. Um, and... Afterwards, Czech came to me and um, we had a discussion about actually, you know, this is kind of what we felt was missing in the industry. We kept on going to all these industry events of kind of standing around, um, you know, sipping wine 
and then discussing how busy we all were and how you know the deal flow was was these days and felt like you know there was actually a lack of diversity in, in the in the VC market, and it would be great if some some organisation could do further to promote that from a more holistic way rather than just doing these dinners. Um, and so at the time, the vision was them kind of born sort of haphazardly from a few of us just like spitballing. Um, and then we, again, the more we kind of reiterated this message with the market um, and our fellow peers, the more it resonated and people join and put their hands up and say, actually, have you thought about internships? Have you thought about um, entrepreneurs? Have you thought about all these other components that we had never even thought about before? And so currently the, the focus has evolved and has shifted. Um, but very much focuses on kind of building up the VC community, building up, um, you know, connecting entrepreneurs with diverse backgrounds to the VC network, and also encouraging students to yeah. hear about VC and, and, and join VC as a potential career option, um, as well as actually fundamentally providing data on what is happening. And I think that wasn't a key focus for us at the beginning, but it's actually really become a very big focal point and sort of where I've been sort of slightly involved uh, from a distance and, and more so this year, which is the data gathering for um, what does the VC landscape look like in the UK. Initially, we came out with a report about two years ago on what is a gender makeup of male to female uh, VCs in the UK. And this year, we're going to release a follow-up report, which we'll be looking at not just the gender ratio, but also split across additional factors such as educational background, employment, um, ethnicity, to sort of really think about holistically about the issue of diversity. Yeah. Um, and that's something, you know, I, I've been working quite a lot on, um, as well as my fellow co-founder, Travis, as well. So yeah. giving Travis a big shout out for the great work he's done there. Nice. Yeah, I think it's interesting that um, VC has traditionally been a very opaque business. People don't really know how what the inner workings are. And I think, um, there has always been that kind of gut feel that it's not the most diverse industry. Um, and what the reason I came across Diversity VC is because of this data gathering, we now have some insight into uh, the actual numbers behind what we felt was the makeup of the industry. And I think that really helps um, increase the transparency of the industry, um, which again will help boost that diversity um, and, and inclusion piece there. Um, in terms of the uh, work that you do in your day job over at, um, over at Eight Roads, uh, how do you, uh, as a fund, think about diversity there? Not just your internal makeup and how to, you know, watch each other's blind spots and things like that, but also who you invest in and, and, and maybe diversifying your portfolio as well, because we've seen uh, more from the US that that is a good business practice as yeah. well as a good thing to do generally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's a great, um, great question. And I think there's many different ways to think about diversity, um, as I've kind of alluded to in our follow-up reports. And we think, you know, that needs to be considered holistic in the portfolio. Um, often it's a bit constrained by the stage we're investing where Series B is, is a slightly later stage. So unfortunately, we're a bit more capped with the company that's already coming through sure. the funnel. Um, but for sure, it is something that we definitely look for, we're very encouraging of, um, and we have found that, you know, one of the few best performing companies in, in our portfolio tend to have very diverse teams. Um, and it is something that we would actively try to be helpful with, especially when the, the topic of recruitment comes up for a senior management team is, you know, where we can, as VCs, can be very, very helpful yeah. with. Um, but I think it's, it's really about kind of thinking about the whole issue a bit more, um, holistic and, and nuanced way and what does that mean is so, you know not just looking for um potential external markers of diversity but really kind of going through that person's background and thinking okay great what has this person gone through in their in their life that gives a good indication that they could be a really great fit for the job regardless of um you know they might not l look on paper as, as potentially the best option um i remember talking to one of our really great ex uh, venture partners who is one of the co-founders of service now and i asked him you know he was a top sales lead and i asked him what do you look for when you hire for sales lead firstly for our portfolio companies and you know for yourself and he's like you know i, I look for um this hunger to prove yourself and that is not you know 
tethered to any benchmarks. And, and doesn't, yeah, that doesn't matter what university exactly. you went to or anything like that. Exactly, and I, and I think that is the fundamental, this open-mindedness is what we sort of talk about when we talk about diversity, is not getting stuck at the certain signifiers, but really looking at the you know, intrinsic value underneath and trying to get to that. And we definitely sort of try to bring that in all of our conversations and even in the way we look at companies. Yeah, I think a lot of these, these kind of macro ideas are, are great, and it's great that we're talking about this a lot more now. Um, I think the having the data, having the transparency, uh, opening out those networks, so the dinners, but also what comes from those dinners is, you know, you start building out this network of, of women in BC. I know that there's a big WhatsApp group here in yeah, London. Yeah, that's true. Um, and things like that. But what do you think more on the kind of operational level? I know that um, Ophelia over at Blossom, who mm -hmm. we spoke to earlier for this series, um, they're, they're very keen on uh, focusing more on their cold intros and, and opening out the ability to pitch them because that means you get more people in the door that you wouldn't traditionally you know, get from the old boys club networks yeah, um, yeah, yeah. such and such. So what do you think about those kind of uh, smaller, kind of more operational aspects of trying to broaden out diversity and inclusion in the industry? Oh, for sure, I think you know, for us, we often have a very um, outbound approach when we, when we get um, access to companies. So uh, you know, for us, we will be actively reaching out to interesting companies regardless of you know, where we, um, sorry, not, not so much regardless, but they, they don't need to be referred to by a network for us yeah. to have a conversation with them. I so would you say. have your themes, your expertise, exactly. and you're reaching out. Exactly, and a lot of the companies that I'm talking to, you know, I don't even know who, what, what the management team looks like when we reach out yeah. to them. And that does bring a really diverse field of people. Great. Um, and in terms of kind of the, the industry while you've been in it, you've been... Uh, Kind of in BC, who at six six years now? Oh gosh, uh, four years. Four years now. I, I would like to think six years, <laughs> but, um, but definitely don't know. Four years now. Um, yeah. How has the industry changed in those four years? Um, because uh, I think you know, since twenty sixteen and setting up For diversity sure, yeah. BC, I'm sure things have changed drastically. They so, have, yeah. how, how, what have you seen changed in that time? Yeah, I think there's really been, um, both on the startup side and on the VC side, there's been a huge changes. I think there's been a lot of new VCs coming through in the micro VC space. New funds are being launched every day yeah. with people from you know way more diverse backgrounds now, more so than ever. Uh, more female VCs setting up their own funds, like Ophelia, as we mentioned. Um, and funds really making a very proactive effort to hire more diverse intakes. You know, we, we like to think we contributed to that diversity VC, um, but but it's just so encouraging to see that this is a topic that everyone is thinking about and t talking about, and people are um, taking notice to sort of think, how do I make my team and my portfolio companies more diverse? Because actually, that is a formula for winning in the long term, and, and also it's just the right thing to do yes. fundamentally. Um, on the startup side, I continue just to be incredibly impressed by the quality of company that's finally coming. I was having a chat yesterday with someone else who's sort of been, been doing it for a while, as I sort of say, like long enough to be dangerous, but not long enough to be yeah. useful. And we're just sort of discussing now you finally get the ecosystem going. You know, you have these founders who's then, you know, had great exit, they have the expertise, and the team have now started building the second generation or the third generation of winners. And now they're just doing everything so much faster. They have all the learnings from before, and they are much more likely to take risky bets with what they're doing. And so that's so encouraging to see. Um, and the, the level of knowledge is just getting higher and higher every, every single day. When I talk to founders, you, know, you really see that they understand what is possible and they really want to go after it. And they don't always want to go to the US, they want to build a local business here in Europe, they want to think about expansion, not just to um, the US, but also in Asia. You know? And that global mindset is also really, really encouraging to see. Yeah. Um, your kind of background is in enterprise software, um, software as a service. Yeah. Um, that's an industry that traditionally has lacked female founder figures. Um, a lot of the, co the companies that I cover on a day-to-day -day basis are the Salesforce, the Microsofts. Um, the only ones I can think of are kind of Safra Katz at Oracle and Diane Green, formerly of, of Google Cloud. Um, do you see more at the early stage now of that enterprise SaaS market, do you see some female founders coming through now um, that perhaps weren't there in the previous iteration? I definitely think so. And I think this is, again, due to the growing, firstly, the growing ecosystem of, of kind of the big tech players coming up to Europe, training up these fantastic enterprise leaders who then sort of want to do something of their own. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's definitely something I'm seeing as well. So it's incredibly encouraging. You know, two years back, I would 
always sort of spend 90% of my week being the only female in the room. And, yeah. and now it's, it's so great whenever I pick up the phone and there is um, a female found at the end. And, you know, it's, I mean, not at the end of the day, still judging them on the quality of their work, but it's just nice to sort of see that, you know, traditionally f uh, female founders seemingly to have limit, um, been much more limited enterprise, more focusing on the consumer, and that's just kind of changing now. Yeah, um, and I think that's the knowledge coming through. Perfect. I think that's a perfect note to finish on. So Great. thank you very much for joining us today, Lynn. Thank you very much, Scott. Cheers.